Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Brookings Institution and to another one of our series of talks on intelligence issues presented by the Brookings Center for Security and Intelligence in the 21st Century. I'm delighted to be here today with John Nixon, uh, author of a fascinating new book, Debriefing the President, the Interrogation of Saddam Hussein. Uh, John. Should I, should I hold it up? Uh, yes, so hold it up. Um, this is not my attempt to get a copy without paying for it. <laughs> it is mine, though. <laughs> oh, good. Um, John served in the Central Intelligence Agency uh, for 13 years uh, before retiring in 2011. Among many things that he did, he ended up becoming the lead CIA interrogator slash debriefer of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein is a figure that stands out in all of our lives. Uh, he ruled Iraq or misruled Iraq for more than three and a half decades. Uh, he has the rare distinction of being someone who invaded two of his neighbors and got his country into two disastrous wars, actually into three disastrous wars, which ultimately led to his undoing. Um, John not only was his uh, debriefer, he was also one of the CIA's leading experts on who Saddam Hussein was. So we have the rare fortune of someone who really knows about this individual and who very rarely, for an American, actually had a chance to meet him. Our format today is very, very simple. I'm going to ask John a series of questions for about a half an hour, 40 minutes, and then I'm going to open it up to you and take two or three questions at a time uh, for you to answer. Uh, we do have a microphone when we get to the audience participation part. Uh, one last thing I would ask you to do, if you have a cell phone or any other kind of uh, laptop device, uh, please put it in storage. Uh, we don't require that you put it underneath uh, in the hold. Uh, you can allow it to continue to have it in the cabin, but please turn it off so we don't hear your very interesting ringtones. With that, um, let me ask you a very simple opening question. How is it that you ended up being the CIA's chief debriefer of Saddam Hussein? Uh, it's a very interesting journey uh, that I took. I had studied uh, a lot about Saddam during my graduate school days at Georgetown University. I was in the National Security Studies program there uh, that was eventually folded into the School of Foreign Service. And then uh, I was recruited by the agency and uh, I interviewed with a number of offices and, but I didn't get any sort of inclination of which one was gonna take me until the day before I was to show up at work. Somebody called me and they said, you'd be working in Iraq issue. And I thought, oh, this is great because uh, this is exactly what I wanted to work on. And uh, I was a leadership analyst in Iraq issue in the Directorate of Intelligence, the DI as it was known then. I think it's called the DA now. The agency loves to change around names and, and, and monikers and, and initials. Uh, but uh, it was the DI then. And so I did that for three years. And uh, I... One of the things that I uh, experienced when I got into the agency, at least back then in 1998, was all of a sudden I walked in t on my first day and everybody was speaking jargon. Everybody was talking about the, the morning meeting. They were saying, well, who's going to the civets? And what does the ADDI want? And we're going to do a PDB on that. And I, I felt like I was watching Spanish television, but not knowing <laughs> Spanish. And, uh, uh, and I realized very soon that I, I had a lot of work to do and I needed to get up to speed with these people because the, the team that I wor wor worked with, uh, my first team, was, was really sharp and really, really smart. And I came from an academic background and I suddenly realized that there was a whole world of information that I had not been privy to and that I had to get up to speed on. And so basically Saddam Hussein and his family and, uh, and the, their hijinks became my world and became something that I studied every day. And as I say in the book, I kind of, I began to live and breathe Saddam. Uh, and, and it was just, it's just something that you have to do if you want to be an expert and if you want to be taken seriously in the intelligence community. And then you um, did a TDY to Baghdad? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, well, it, in uh, 2000, by 2003, I had, um, I had moved over to Iran issue. Uh, but I still retained a very strong interest in Iraq. 
Um, a, a very uh, good friend of mine uh, and a mentor of sorts, Judy Yaffe, I remember her telling me that if you want to know what's happening in Iran, you have to know what's going on in Iraq. And if you want to know what's going on in Iraq, you have to know what's going on in Iran. So I started working on Iran. And then there was a, uh, the, once the war started, there was a uh, request for people, for uh, uh, intelligence officers to volunteer. Uh, and so I went out there in uh, October of uh, 2003 to replace what was then called the HVT-1 analyst. HVT-1 was Saddam's uh, designation. It's high value target number one. And uh, I was supposed to basically work at station and uh, interface with the special forces and then try to help them find Saddam. And at first it was tough going. Being in Baghdad in 2003 was a lot like the film Groundhog Day. Groundhog, it was like every day seemed the same, no matter what. And there was also a lot of what, in order to get anything done, you had to build up um, relationships with people, uh, and uh, people in the military, people in the intelligence community that were out there, and people in the diplomatic, what, what, dip, what, what stood for a diplomatic community, which was the uh, CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority. And that's how you got things done. And every day was like pushing a boulder up a hill. And at the end of the day, you would say, God, this feels great. I got this boulder finally up the hill. And then the next morning, you'd walk out of your trailer, and there would be the boulder, you know? And you'd have to do it all again, the same the next day. But I was doing that. And then um, in November, I was starting to despair a little bit about whether or not we were going to find him. But then through a series of raids, and, and some were purely accidental, uh, special Forces got a bead on where Saddam was through a facilitator, a uh, bodyguard, and they were eventually able to capture the, the bodyguard that we had kind of identified for them as being you know, key to understanding where Saddam might be, and that's what led to his capture. And then you met him for the first time. I mean, yeah. here you are, um, having lived and breathed Saddam Hussein, uh, kind of dysfunctional figure in many ways. Yes. And you're facing him face to face as, were you identified as CIA to him or? No, no, no. It's a, we were, uh, it was that, that night of the capture, about seven o'clock, uh, things really started to speed up. And by eight o'clock, we had no, we got word that the military had picked somebody up and they were bringing him uh, down from the Tikrit area to uh, Baghdad. And that was at that point that um, the chief of station was not there, uh, but the exter happened to be in Iraq at the time. And he asked me, he asked me how I would identify him. And I told him, you know, there are, there are things that you could look for, you know, uh, tribal markings, tribal tattoos on his hand and wrist. You know, I said he has a scar on his leg from a, a bullet wound. And he said, well, we, you know, we, we got to make sure that it's not one of these body doubles, you know. And I, I remember, I was like, oh, my God. Um, one of the most persistent myths about Saddam Hussein was the body double. Uh, everybody believed, and to this day, there are people that still believe that the body double existed or exists. Um, there were no body doubles. And, uh, I, and I, the, it just seemed that the more we told people this, whether it was in our written products or in our briefings, the more the myth persisted. And, uh, but this was one night when, when he said that, I, instead of saying, sir, there are no body doubles, I just said, you're absolutely right, sir. We have to make sure about this. So, uh, I, and I'm your man. So uh, uh, they, put me in the, uh, they put me in the suburban, and we went out uh, around midnight. And we got out there, to, and then we sort of waited for about two hours until the military had finished shaving Saddam and cleaning him up. And also, they were questioning him and giving him a, a physical examination. And then we walked, somebody said, okay, guys, it's your turn. So we walked down this hall, and uh, it, it was sort of like being backstage at a rock concert, but instead of groupies, it was military guys and fatigues. And uh, we get down there, and then the store opens, and, and, there he, and he's just sitting there, kind of like, sort of like he comes here every Saturday night, and <laughs> almost as though, like, and, and he acted as though we were his guests. Uh, and I think the thing that struck me most about that first encounter was just how calm and collected he was. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, a characteristic of his upbringing and his experience as, as a revolutionary uh, political player in Bath politics. And also just the, his, by his nature and the way he 
sort of had his security apparatus always around him. He just seemed to be always prepared for almost anything. Um, and so we walked in and we began to question him. And he at first was very, it was very contentious at first. He sort of, uh, you know, I said something to him and, and he said, and he just went, <laughs> and he had this mean laugh. And he said, who are you guys? Through an interpreter, of course. Who are you guys? Identify yourselves to me. Are you, are you Makabarat, Stikbarat? Who are you? What are your names? And then somebody, the head of my team stepped in and said, we are here to, we are here to ask you questions. You're not, you're not to answer, ask us questions. You know, you're here to answer our questions. So, and Saddam listened, he said, and then we went on. And he actually answered most of the questions that I had. Now, I saw the tribal markings, and I saw the scar on the leg. And I have to say to you right now, the minute I laid eyes on him, I knew it was him. It, it just, you, one of the things that you do as an analyst, uh, as a leadership analyst, is you look at a lot of videotape, and you look at a lot of pictures. Because people, you're always getting questions about leaders because in the press, both our press and international press, there's always rumors about people being sick or people being infirmed or that they're people being killed uh, and that they're not alive anymore. And so you're always looking at, at videotape and the latest videotape. And after years of doing this, you know, and this person's sitting two feet away from me, and it just wasn't, there wasn't a doubt in my mind. So we, we talked, and one of the things, one of the most interesting things that happened that first night was um, there were two interpreters in the room. Uh, there was a military interpreter and there was a CIA interpreter. And the CIA interpreter would, was interpreting and uh, the military interpreter started to get kind of nasty with us. And he, he would just, the, our interpreter would say something, he'd be like, no, no, you, you misinterpreted that. That's wrong. He said this. And, and then he would explain it. And then they would argue a little bit. And then a few minutes later, no, no, again, you're, you're, do, you're in, interpreting that wrong. And Saddam was sitting there the whole time. And there for a while, Saddam started doing this, like, sort of like he was at a tennis match. you know. <laughs> and, and then he got a smile on his face. And then he would turn, like, our interpreter would ask him a question. He'd turn to the military interpreter and go, <laughs> <laughs> and the military interpreter would respond. He would say, like, you know, and then like one time he was like, well, that leads me to one of the. <laughs> but the thing is, if I can just one. Yeah, please. The, the point is, though, um, Saddam was able to get two people, two organizations on the same side, one in uniform, one in civilian clothes. It became very tense. And he got two, these two sides to start disagreeing with one another. And it's sort of a metaphor for how he ruled his country. I'm sorry. Well, it gets to one of the most fascinating observations in the book, which is that the CIA and the US government didn't seem to have a plan for what to, how to interrogate, debrief, or even deal with Saddam Hussein, which when you think about it, um, we certainly had a lot of plan, time to think about this or prepare for it, yes. and yet when we got there, it's kind of a metaphor for the whole war and the whole invasion. Yes, absolutely. Uh, everything seemed to be done on the fly. Um, Another myth that we were dealing with constantly, and because there was a lot of reporting supporting this myth, was that Saddam was going to go down with a ship that he had suicide belts and suicide vests. That, in fact, you know, he could take out a whole city block just with the amount of explosives that he can just press a button. And so, and now the U.S. military, to be fair, has to be careful about that because it's their folks who are going to get killed if that happens. But the more I talk to people, the more I realized that everybody seemed to believe that he was going to kill, like he would, he would die in a blaze of glory. Whereas our, our psychiatrist, CIA psychiatrist, and this had been going back for years, I'd, this is one of the first things I remember learning about him from our own people, which was that psychologically speaking, Saddam Hussein is not a martyr. He's not a person who's going to kill himself. He's somebody who sees himself as the living embodiment of the greatness of his nation and his cause, and that losing him would be to lose Iraq. And so therefore, he's going to be, he's a survivor. He's going to be somebody who's going to want to survive for another day. And I think the same can be said of people like Gaddafi and Khomeini and bin Laden. And, and yet, for some reason, and I've seen this you know, with a lot of leaders, people think, like bin Laden, everybody, the same thing in the press. I read, oh, they thought there were suicide belts, and, uh, and he's going to go down and take, try to take as many out as he can. And it's just psychologically speaking, these are not. So we were 
Bruce is right. Um, uh, Washington was, I think, very much caught by surprise, so much so that when Saddam gave himself up and the, the, we and we captured him, um, we were waiting for Washington to sort of tell us what to do in terms of well, how do you want to handle this. Um, and they took about seven days. And during that first seven days, nobody talked to Saddam. And in fact, he even said to one of his guards, like on day three or four, he said, why is nobody coming to speak to me? I don't, I don't understand this. Because Saddam really didn't want to sit in his uh, cell all day long with nothing to do and nothing to read and nothing to write. So, um, and we found out, um, strangely enough, we found out through CNN, uh, like uh, almost uh, six days in, that um, Rumsfeld told a CNN reporter that the CIA was going to take a lead in debriefing Saddam Hussein, which made us all very happy, the military very happy. The only thing he didn't provide was the coordinates of the building that, uh, uh, so, that the, so anybody could take a shot at us. Um, but there's something that happens also when, the, when, when someone's captured. And that is the shock of capture can lead them to divulge certain things that maybe they might not have because it's it sort of a, a, a sort of gets people being taken into custody can be very upsetting. Um, and I don't know if that would have happened with Saddam, but we'll never know because, again, we didn't have anything to do with him for seven days, and I thought that was a, a terrible waste. Um, but eventually we got started or roughly around the 19th or the 20th of December, and that was a uh, uh, one of the. It was another sort of eye-opening instant because rather than the contentious Saddam, um, that that day was very interesting simply because uh, whether you love him or hate him or whatever you think of him, I will say that I thought that Saddam Hussein was one of the more charismatic people I've ever met in my life, and that when he walked into a room, you felt a change in the room. And some people have this, and some people don't. Bruce has it in spades, but you know. <laughs> Um, but the thing is, uh, you know, he came in and they took the hood off him and he, he just sort of looked around a little bit at us and then he started working the room. He just started going, shaking our hands and just making small talk with us in his limited English, you know, it's sun shining. How are you? Nice day, you know. And, uh, and so we got down to talking and we didn't really have a whole lot of... Um, uh, carrots or sticks to offer on this because we really didn't know what was going to happen with him. Uh, there was no ju operating judiciary in Iraq, and we didn't know, we didn't think the Bush administration would necessarily turn him over to the International Criminal Court. So we couldn't necessarily say Saddam will, you know, we'll talk to the judge and see if we can get a year off or something. Uh, and as far as you know, sticks. Um, the head of the team at one point had considered using enhanced interrogation techniques. But fortunately, that was, uh, that was squelched by, by Washington. Um, and Saddam was given Geneva code protections. Um, so we got down to talking, and basically we said, you know, we want to talk about history. And we want you to know that, if, that whatever you say will be read at the highest levels of our government, meaning the President of the United States. And the talking about history really appealed to Saddam because he was very interested in history. And also the, the idea that what he said would be read by George Bush also appealed to him. And uh, he, uh, he, you know, he, he responded to this and he said, yes, history is very important. Historians are like people who can see through the night. And then he put the finger up. And I, I came to realize that when the finger came up, that meant you better listen. And in, when he was in power, that meant you really better listen. Uh, and he said, but I will not submit to interrogation. You know, and we said, oh, we're not going to interrogate you. No, 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 we'll just talk about history. Of course we're going to interrogate him. Of course we're going to talk about things that he doesn't want to. But we just said, okay. And, and then from that point on, we, it was like off to the races. So, Well, of course, the, the $64 million question every American wanted to know was, where are the weapons of mass destruction? Or what happened to the weapons of mass destruction? I'm sure that was the question that, Washington wanted you to yeah. bring home the bacon on more than anything else. It was the only question <laughs> that Washington <laughs> seemed to want to know. We, we, the agency had a few questions that they wanted, you know. I, I had, we, I had a, a number of topics that I wanted to talk to, but certainly there were priorities. And the one question that came from, the, the, the instructions were this, basically. Um, keep them talking. Find out what you can. 
and wait for the FBI to show up because the FBI is going to take over uh, the debriefing process once they get out to Iraq uh, because this w was going to eventually lead some way to some sort of an adjudication process and they wanted the FBI to be able to uh, uh, be the ones who would go into courtroom and give evidence against Saddam. So um, the find out what we, what we can really refer to though is weapons of mass destruction. And we talked a great deal about, um, about WMD with Saddam. And my successor, uh, a guy named Bill, who was a former UNSCOM inspector, spent a great deal of time talking to him about this as well. And both he and I came to the same conclusion, is that you know, Saddam didn't have weapons of mass destruction, or um, it didn't have nuclear weapons of mass destruction, and that he didn't have any programs going. And he was not about to start any programs up. Now, this differs a little bit from what Charles Dulfer has said in the Dulfer Commission. He has said, he has claimed that Saddam was going to uh, restart his program once he got out from underneath sanctions, but I don't, I've never seen any evidence, and I certainly didn't see any evidence from talking to Saddam or talking to any of the other uh, HVTs that we talked to. Um, and he, you know, it was, it was a really, it was the beginning of a series of sort of startling um, Startling insights, I felt startling insights uh, about Saddam. In the, in the larger arc of things, and of Saddam's career, I think we had a, a fairly reliable set of knowledge. But as I talked to him, and as we began focusing on more granular parts of his life and what he was doing and, and things that we didn't know about, things started to emerge that really made me question a lot, a lot of what we had thought prior to that. Um, and, and WMD, certainly, I was a believer in WMD, as was everybody I knew. In fact, I participated in many, many briefings with our liaison partners, within the intelligence community, with academics, and I never heard anybody ever question whether or not Saddam had a weapons program going or whether he wanted to get a nuclear weapon. Um, I, I, we did hear stuff in the media, um, but I, Based on the, the what at times seemed compelling information that we had in the intelligence world, um, the stuff that we heard in the media we tended to discount. Uh, there were a number of things that, um, but in going back, another thing that we also kind of noticed about Saddam was his lack of engagement. His, he was sort of disengaged from the day-to-day -day running of his country. And it turned more and more things over to some of his more senior lieutenants. He, he was still president of Iraq. He still regarded himself as such. Uh, and he still wanted to make the big decisions. But he looked to be more and more interested in sort of other pursuits. And, uh, and I remember right before I made the switch from Iraq to Iran as an analyst, uh, and seeing little, little hints of this. And uh, I feel it was very unfortunate that we never pursued that, those, those hints because they were accurate. And we had a tendency to, at the agency, and I think throughout the intelligence community, and in our government, certainly, uh, to see Saddam as this master manipulator uh, who had his fingerprint, who was playing the mighty Wurlitzer, if you will, uh, and who was always out thinking us and out foxing us and trying to get out from underneath sanctions, which he probably would have done had, had events not intervened. But that was a, uh, that was a very uh, uh, inaccurate uh, assessment uh, because he was not like that near the end. He was, at the end, he was very interested in writing a novel. And he had written novels before, but he was working on a draft uh, and he was sending drafts to Tarek Aziz, his former foreign minister, like a week before uh, uh, the, uh, the invasion. And even his son, Uday, was talking to his girlfriend in uh, uh, Germany and saying, well, why don't you come, you know, why don't you come to uh, Baghdad? I'm going to be, this is 2003, he would have been, I think, 164, so 39. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a great party, you know. By this, by, by the time Uday's 39th birthday happened, I think he may have been dead. Uh, so, I mean, this is, it's a very bizarre uh, kind of story, but the thing is, the, the, Saddam was not really, um, I think, uh, the same Saddam that we saw in the 1980s and the 1990s. Looking back on it, it's now 15 years since um, then Vice President Cheney told us that Iraq uh, not only had weapons of mass destruction programs, but implied that he had a nuclear bomb. Um, 
I won't ask you to psychoanalyze Vice President Cheney, although that would be fascinating as well. Looking back on it, how did the intelligence community get this so wrong, in your opinion? How many hours do we have? <laughs> um, the, uh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, I think there are several reasons. One is, uh, I think there are certain, th there's a certain amount of groupthink that I think happens in the intelligence community that gets passed on, even though we're all cognizant of the dangers of groupthink and try to do everything that we can. But there, there was such a pervasive feeling that this is, this is just bedrock truth. Um, and I think there was an inability to ask ourselves really, really tough questions. And also, there are parts of the intelligence community, certainly I, I speak from the analytic standpoint, um, that as far as analysis goes, sometimes people get lazy, and sometimes people forget to question their initial assumptions. And there's also a part of this bureaucratic structure of the CIA in which writing pieces tend to, you know, language tends to get blessed from on high and you end up using that language over and over again. And I, I'll tell you right now, the minute you start cutting and pasting anything, um, you, you're not an analyst anymore, number one. Number two, you're not thinking about the subject anymore. And I, it's the most dangerous thing any analyst can do. And then finally, there is the fact that, you know, we as Americans, we love to sort of when, we, when, when a country doesn't do something or a leader doesn't do something that we like, we say we're not going to have diplomatic relations and we beat our chest and we, we, we try to isolate them. And, we, and we, we try to look strong to our domestic community, domestic supporters. And you know, the only thing is we don't realize how much we hurt ourselves by not recognizing a nation and having a diplomatic presence in that country. Um, so much of what ha so much of... Uh, it's entirely possible that if we would have had an embassy and a station in Iraq in the years before the war, it's entirely possible we would never have st we still would have made these same mistakes, but at least we would have had a chance. Um, certainly by the end of 2000, by, by 2003, um, our sources of information had really dried up and we, had re we relied a great deal. When I, I went back and looked at a lot of reporting after, uh, after my experience with Islam, and some of the things that I read, and especially some of the things that I thought were good, and I came back and I was like, oh my God, what the hell were we looking at? You know, what, what were we reading? What, who, who the hell was disseminating this? This is, this is garbage. Um, and, you know, uh, it's part of the whole fiasco that is Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, I just, I know myself and a lot of the other analysts, you know, we all, had the sense that we were trying to do something good for Iraq, um, and, and, and we all feel very badly at how things have turned out. And I think it's, we feel badly about that is because it's very hard to find a, a, a good a success story out of this whole thing. Um, so, well, let's let's go through a little bit of the history. Um, August 1990, Saddam invades Kuwait. Um, did you talk about that decision oh, yeah. with him? Uh, does he, did he seem to have any regrets? Or It was the closest I ever got to Saddam saying he had made a mistake. Um, Saddam never, never admitted to mistakes. He, uh, it was, it's, at times it was sort of like talking to a, talking to a 15-year-old. You know? He never made mistakes. Everybody was against him. And, uh, and no matter what I do, nobody's going to like it. You know, so therefore, you know, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Um, so anybody who has a 15 or 16 year old out there might might share that feeling. But the thing is, um, the closest I got to him to to acknowledge a mistake, I said to him, I said, "Let's talk about Kuwait." And he just he just kind of put his hands up. He goes, "Oh, this subject gives me such a headache." And it was sort of this feeling of like he knew that after this he had gotten himself behind the eight ball. And that he had never he, he never got out from behind it, and uh, we talked about this. And there have been a lot of things said about what he said. I think um, the FBI said that Saddam had insulted the 
the womanhood, or the, the honor of Iraqi womanhood, because the Emir of Kuwait had said that he was going to turn every Iraqi woman into a, a prostitute. Uh, you know, uh, maybe that was said. I, that wasn't the reason why he invaded. I, one of the, the, I think the chief reason that Saddam decided to invade Kuwait, first of all, you know, when a, when a president or a leader invades a country or decides that he's going to, you know, make war on a neighboring country, you know, we like to think that there are studies done and that they meet with, that president meets with his advisors, that there are, you know, uh, he gets all of the input from the intelligence community and option papers are produced and implications are raised and what might, what might the fallout be? Saddam did none of that. He just decided one day at an at a RCC meeting that he was going to teach them a lesson. And the lesson was for this, um, Saddam was trying to rebuild his country after the Iran-Iraq war. He was, you know, tens of billions of dollars in debt. Uh, and he basically told the Emiratis and the Kuwaitis and the Saudis that he could not get any sort of international financing from uh, places like the World Bank or the IMF because all of these uh, debts were outstanding and that he was asking them to uh, uh, forgive his loans. And basically their response was, no, we're not going to forgive them, but you can just pay, pay us back when you can. And uh, Saddam said, no, you don't understand. I, I mean, I can't rebuild my country and I have this giant army of, you know, of a million men standing around with nothing to do and uh, I've got to keep paying them. And because, you know, in Iraq, having a large standing army with nothing to do is not, is something that can be very bad for any leader. Uh, so, uh, and then the response was, well, no, just pay us when you can. And so Saddam saw that as the, the height of ingratitude and, and an insult to him personally. Uh, one of the things that I got from Saddam when I was talking to him was how important money is. Now, I understand we, money is important to all of us, but for some reason, Saddam, it was, it was a visceral thing. And I think it, was, it stems from the fact that Saddam was a, was a poor boy from Tikrit who never really had anything. He was a poor boy that grew up to make good and become, get to, climb to the top of the political structure in his country. And whenever we talked about money, Saddam's demeanor would change. He would get very serious. And he just, he felt this, and it was the source of his pride and the source of his power. And, uh, and to be insulted like that, I think, was just too much for him. Saddam, of course, not, in, not only invaded two of his neighbors, uh, but he butchered thousands of his own people, um, particularly the Kurds in the Anfal campaign and Shia after the uprising in um, 2001. It's got to be a kind of a strange experience for someone who's uh, been an academic and then an intelligence analyst to be sitting down with someone who was a mass murderer yeah. at the same time and in the same room with him. Did, you ever get any sense of uh, second thoughts about that, or that yeah. was just being the ruler of Iraq? No, um, you know, at one point we were talking about the Kurds, and he said to me, he said, I love the Kurds. I don't know what it is about them. Uh, maybe it's because they're not city folk and they're not filled up with these ideas, uh, that they're just plain and simple people. Uh, and I used to love to go visit them, but they, their political leaders around the time of the early 60s began to change things. And I think for some, and I think he was being genuine. I think he really did. I mean, I remember at the time thinking, if you love the Kurds, you certainly had a, an odd way of showing it. But um, I, I think that he was being genuine in the sense that he did love Kurds, but that anybody, Saddam always had a place in his regime for Kurds or for Shia, uh, but the, 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 the but there was that they had to support him. And, uh, and if they didn't support him and supported somebody else, that, he saw that as, as treasonous. And, and that would be, that's punishable. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we discovered during this time was uh, about, we talked about Halabja, and I, that was the most contentious uh, debriefing part that I, I had with Saddam. That's when he really, that, that's when he got the angriest with me, and he really lost his temper. And it, it, was, it, it was difficult talking about these things with him because he would get 
very confrontational, number one, naturally. But also, you know, in any sort of a debriefing process, you know, you want to sort of spend a little time of sort of developing rapport before you start getting into the really tough issues. And, uh, and Saddam, uh, we never knew during the time that I was there, we never knew exactly when uh, our time with him was going to be over. Because from day to day, we weren't sure, because we had been told almost every day that the FBI would be out here any day now. And by the time I left on January 12th they, or 13th, um, they still were there. Uh, now, so we couldn't do a lot of rapport building, so we would have to sort of jump into these topics very, very quickly. And um, when we talked about the Lobja, Saddam really got very, very upset and very angry and very, like, sort of leaning forward in his chair and talking through clenched teeth and breathing very heavily. And it was a little frightening, to be quite honest with you. Um, uh, he could be charming at times, but he was also, he could, he could be frightening and really nasty and arrogant and, you know, he was sort of a jumble of contradictions in that, in that sense. But one of the things is he said to me, he said, you know, I did not give that. I asked, I, I had asked him if he, about, if he had made the decision about Halabja at an RCC meeting. And he just said, I didn't make that decision. And then he, you know, put up the finger and he said, it was, went into this, I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of President Bush. You know, I will do what I have to do to protect my country. But I did not make that decision and, or did not give that order. That's what he said. And, uh, and I didn't believe him at first. And, and this is one of the tricky things about talking to Saddam Hussein is that even when he was telling the truth, like he was so secretive and so suspicious that even when he was telling the truth, it was hard to believe him. And I found myself, I didn't believe him. And then I started going through the record and seeing some, what some of the other HVTs said, uh, which supported what he said, and then looking at some of the documentation, which supported what he said. And then I came to the conclusion that he did not, that that was a, Halabja was a decision that was made on the battlefield by Nizar al-Khazraji, uh, who was the general in charge on fall. And, uh, you know, um, now, and Saddam actually was very upset about this, not because of the loss of life, but because uh, the use of chemical weapons had happened in, um, uh, in Halabja. At, it was in PUK-held ter territory, uh, which and PUK was allied with Iran, and he was afraid that Iran was going to use this to besmirch Iraq's name with the international media. So, You, you um, describe an American intelligence community, an America, an America that had a hard time understanding Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Um, I get the sense that uh, <coughs> The opposite was true as well, that yeah. Saddam Hussein didn't really understand America or how America operated. So, yeah, um, very true. Saddam really understood, I thought he understood his country very well, and I thought he understood Iraqis very well. He understood their, their wants and their needs, um, and he was a lot like, you know, I hate to say this, I'm not making any connection to any other comparison with Lyndon Johnson, but he was a lot like Lyndon Johnson in the fact that he was a very transactional leader. And he always knew how to kind of cajole people and to you know, give them gifts and when to threaten. And he had a lot of skills in that sense. But he, but he was very good at reading his own people. But when it came to the larger international community, when it came to understanding international relations, and certainly when it came to the United States, uh, he was he was out of his depth, and you know again he 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 was a rather poorly educated, although by comparison with others, I mean he was actually better educated. But I thought he was a rather poorly educated, um, you know, hometown boy that made good, and he, he had never really traveled outside of Iraq very much, um, and he you know, as far as America goes, he. He said a number of things uh, that just showed me that he just had no concept of how like, our government worked or, or what, how things got done. Uh, I remember talking to him about Nizar Hamdoun and telling him how, you know, uh, how, how, what, a, what an asset he was to Iraq because he is the former ambassador, uh, Iraqi ambassador to the United States, and then he was at the UN as the ambassador there. And he was a very, he was a formidable guy, formidable intellect, I thought, and also a very good spokesman for the regime. And, and you guys got a sense that Saddam kind of was like, like, yeah, you know. But he also, we talked about 9-11 one day. And, uh, you know, and this was really kind of fascinating. Um, 
But we, I said to him, you know, Saddam, a lot of people think that, you know, you, you were involved in 9-11. And he's like, how can people think that? He said, didn't you read the letter? And I said, uh, what letter are you talking about? I, I, said, I sent a letter. I gave it to Tariq Aziz, and I sent a letter to the American people. And I think he had given letters to some NGO, some, some like Voices in the Wilderness, I think. And then, he, uh, and then he said, didn't you get the letter? He gave it to Ramsey Clark. Didn't you read that letter? Didn't the American people see this? And, and I had to say to him, you know, Ramsey Clark is kind of a fringe-like figure, and he's not necessarily considered a, a mainstream voice that you want to you know, use, the Ameri use to get to reach out to the American people. And he just had this look of in incredulity. Uh, and another time we were talking about Monica Lewinsky and the Clinton scandal, you know, and he said, what's an intern? And, uh, and so I, I said, well, I tried to explain to him what an intern was, and he just, he was just like, hmm. And he couldn't, couldn't grasp the concept at all. And then, and then he kind of fell back on, well, you know, she's Jewish, isn't, she's Jewish, isn't she? And I said, yes, she is. And he said, and the, uh, it's the media is, is stirring this, was stirring all this stuff up, right? You know, and the media is owned by Jewish people, right? And this is all a Zionist conspiracy because uh, Iraq is, uh, Clinton administration is being easy on Iraq, so the Zionists are happy about that, so now they've created the scandal to damage the Clinton administration. So everything always came back to that they were trying to harm him and, uh, and, uh, and Iraq. Uh, um, and again, just a, a clear misreading of, of everything uh, concerning <coughs> America. And one of the, you know, I don't want me to go on, but one of the most interesting things was when we said to him about 9-11, I said, what was your reaction to 9-11? He said, it was relief. And I said, what? what do you mean? And he said, well, I was relieved to know that now the United States would understand that the same people that opposed them, the same people that flew buildings, flew airplanes into their buildings, uh, would now uh, know that I'm dealing, uh, uh, they're my enemies as well. And that America, with all of its intelligence and money and power, would have to come to the conclusion, would have to come to the conclusion that we have the same enemy and that this would change policy in the United States and they would see that the United States and Iraq are on the same side. I'm going to come to your questions in just a couple of minutes, but I want to fast forward in the book a little bit um, to later in your career when you're now briefing uh, George W. Bush. Yeah. And uh, I'll put my words on it, not yours. I got the impression that these so-called deep dive briefing sessions uh, for the president were more um, uh, entertainment uh, than they were necessarily education or more uh, geared to get the president to say to the agency, I really love you and I love what you're doing for me, rather than necessarily to confront him with what might be unpleasant uh, realities. So am I reading that right? Uh, to a certain degree, I think yes. Um, I think there was a feeling in the Bush administration by that point that, well, first of all, the interagency process that was supposed to produce ideas to, for the president and options for the president had, had clearly broken down. And early in the administration, that wasn't considered a bad thing, you know, because that meant that they could do what they wanted to. But the thing is, by 2007, 2008, um, I think there was a feeling that there's a lot of untapped knowledge that was out there, particularly in the minds of analysts, uh, that it might be helpful to have people come into the Oval Office and talk to the president, because maybe it might spur some new thinking or what have you. Um, but I mean, I, that's the way I, I, I would hope that it was, that what, I would hope that that's what spurred this. Um, but I found that a lot of the times, especially when dealing with President Bush, Vice President Cheney was a lot different. Vice President Cheney, was, he, he was very skilled, he was a much more savvy player and he was much more skilled at asking questions and certainly asking questions and not giving any clear hint of why he's asking this question. Whereas President Bush was the opposite. He, he was sort of a, it was more of a validation process for him. And it was just, he just sort of leaned, you know, first of all, he, he liked to have very, very knowledgeable, smart people come in and then try to sort of use his down-home folksy way 
and cut them off and show that he was, he was the boss and you, know, you, you have to listen to him. But also, he had this way of saying, well, the man was still a threat, huh? Don't you agree? And, you know, and he did this about Saddam. He did this about Sadr, which was another briefing I did with him. And, you know, a man's a thug. That's all he is. Don't you agree? And, and he would put you, the way he would question you, he'd sort of back you into a corner and you would say, well, yes and no, Mr. President. And he really didn't like getting yes and no answers. And he didn't, he, it was either yes or no. And he didn't like nuance. And he didn't like, um, he thought that if you gave him sort of an ambiguous answer, you were trying to evade the question. And a lot of times he would back you into this corner so it would make you sound like you were sort of an apologist or defending Muqtada al-Sadr or defending Saddam Hussein when that was not the case at all. Um, but it made for a very difficult uh, uh, trip to the White House. And uh, you know, um, I, I got into one very long 30 minute, I don't know what it was. It was uh, uh, you know, this sort of question and answer period um, that um, I tried to tell the president that Muqtada al-Sadr was probably a force that, a, per, a person who was going to remain in, uh, uh, a force in Iraqi politics for a long time, for some time to come. And, uh, and to, in fairness to President Bush, um, he was receiving a lot of different viewpoints from a lot of different people. And I think that that must have been, for someone like him, that must have been hard to, he always was, he was one of these people who, didn't, again, didn't want nuance, didn't understand ambiguity, and felt that there was always a right and a wrong answer. And it's very hard, if you're getting all different viewpoints, it it's becomes very hard to assimilate those viewpoints and come up with a conclusion. Uh, I know all of you are thinking about some other leader today and comparing these, but uh, <laughs> the book is not about that administration. As I said earlier... My next book is going to be called George, We Hardly Knew You. So. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's open it up to your questions. Uh, there's a microphone. Please identify yourself. I'm going to take two or three questions at a time. Ladies first, right up here in the front. Uh, thank you. This has been fascinating. Uh, I was wondering whether during the time you were talking with Saddam, was he aware, do you think, that the end result was going to be his execution? Right behind there. Thank you. Uh, Dieter Detke, Georgetown University. Um, the question uh, that I'm interested in is um, when did the Bush administration know there were no nuclear weapons and no weapons of mass destruction? Was it, I mean, uh, go back to March 2003 when the invasion took place, wasn't there enough indication already that there were no weapons of mass destruction? Um, at the time, you know, March. And and then look at the fact that the uh, inspection process, the UN inspection process, was interrupted on March 19, of course. Now, why did that happen? Why was it so necessary to interrupt the inspection process that was going well since November, December, right? I mean, there were no obstacles put up anymore by Saddam, so they had total access and and, and weren't there assets, um, I mean intelligence assets, in Iraq of the Bush administration that indicated before March of 2003 no weapons of mass destruction? Thank you. More on this side, right here in the front. Thank you. Um, picking up on the WMD question, um, did you talk to Saddam at all about uh, why he was so obstructionist with the unscum inspectors in the late 90s after Hussein Kamal defected, after they turned over all those documents in the chicken farm episode, at which point he had no more WMD materials, and yet they were still blocking um, unscum inspectors from entering lots of facilities. He talked about that um, contradiction in him trying to prove that he was no longer holding these weapons at the same time, uh, being so obstructionist with, uh, with the inspectors in that period. Okay. Um, let's see. The... Uh, the execution. Um, yes, absolutely. He fully understood that. He said to me that he knew that this was would lead to his execution. That that I mean, this is uh, December of two thousand three, and again, we had no. There was no clear indication just how he was going to be handled from this point onward. Who was going to try him? 
or, or anything like that. But uh, I, I, I knew that this was probably going to lead to his execution, and he said as much to me. Um, and uh, he was pretty clear-eyed. Now, that didn't necessarily mean that he wasn't always trying to maybe interest, uh, interest us in a deal. Um, I think there were times when Saddam would really perk up when he would feel that maybe I can kind of get the Americans to you know, see things my way and maybe we can do a deal of some sort. Um, but, uh, you know, once, once the... Um, once the Bush once we kind of came back to the Bush administration uh, about weapons of mass destruction, well, from talking to him, because really he was the last. I mean, that was the real last stone unturned, you know. Um, uh, then I think the Bush administration just lost interest in him, and you know they were just more than happy to see him executed, and uh, and certainly the Maliki government was, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really a fascinating thing. Uh, Prime Minister Maliki had, had, had all these problems uh, since he came into office, but once he executed Saddam, it was like he, he got a new rebirth and a, a, new, a new sense of purpose in being Prime Minister. Um, and it was really fascinating, but uh, I, I personally, I was disturbed by, I mean, I understand Saddam did many bad things, and, uh, you know, I knew that it was going to lead to his execution. I had hoped that the execution, as I mentioned in the book, I'd hoped that the execution would have been done, that it would bring a sense of you know, justice, a sense of closure to Saddam's victims. I had hoped that people would see that a rule of law has been established and that, the, that maybe this is the reason why there's a new Iraq. Um, but instead, it was, it was done the way it's always been done in Iraq, which is kind of like a, just an execution you know, done in the middle of the night. You know? It was sort of like when they put uh, Abdel Karim Qasim's body on television you know, um, and, uh, in the 60s. Um, and uh, you know, and I, I just remember thinking, this is not what we came here to do. But as far as WMD goes, uh, and in your question about the UNSCOM, um, Saddam, I believe, had very had real, real issues with UNSCOM, not just because of intrusion on sovereignty, which is important, but I think that Saddam saw UNSCOM for, for what it was, which was also an intelligence gathering operation. And I think that Saddam knew that there was a lot of intelligence officials embedded in the UNSCOM process, and that he, uh, and he knew what they were there for, and it wasn't just to verify weapons caches or inventories. It was there to find regime vulnerabilities. And I think that, um, you know, one of the questions I always get asked is, why didn't he just comply with the international community's wishes? And if you look at it, if it's just them trying to inventory weapons, um, yeah, that's going to be problematic, but it's, it's, it's possibly solvable, you know, and probably doable. But if it's, if it's also some, putting people in on the ground in Iraq to kind of get at regime vulnerabilities, then it becomes perfectly understandable why he was so willing to, uh, to not cooperate. Um, I'm just going to add my two cents on the question that you raised about the knowledge about WMD in, in the Bush administration. And remind you of the famous meeting in which George Tenet says it's a slam dunk. We've all focused on what Tenet said, but very few people have actually looked at that meeting in its context. In that meeting, the president, the vice president, and the senior officials had all gathered together to hear the intelligence community represented by George Tenet and his deputy, John McLaughlin, present the case that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And when John McLaughlin was done, the president said to the two of them, that's it? That's all you have? And then George Tenet, much to his regret, throws in the killer line, oh my god, it's a slam dunk. Much to his regret, because that will be the line that is used when he's ousted from being director to characterize his whole position. What's really important about that meeting is that when the president, vice president, confronted with the evidence, they recognized themselves. It wasn't very good evidence. It was a pretty slim picking. Let's take some more questions. Right here in the front. 
You see, I pick people in the front because I'm very nearsighted and I can't see anybody <laughs> in the back. Remember that when you come next time. Um, Tamima Talabani, uh, Georgetown University. Um, so we are aware of, uh, in October 2002, Saddam Hussein gave full amnesty to the prisoners, uh, and including political prisoners. Sort of uh, building up on that, um, when he, when he, did he share any thoughts or expectations about the security situation of Iraq post-war? And was he aware of that in any way? Was he aware of the deteriorating security situation and, and such? Uh, thank you. Let's take one more. The gentleman right there on. Yes, you. Hi, Sam Newman, uh, former professor in Baghdad University. Um, I understand that um, uh, Saddam that doesn't understand the uh, United States system and how can how deal with them but after your investigation did you think also the American intelligence office doesn't understand Saddam uh, and his regime we'll take one more about right up here in the front Lou Gagliano do you think the intel that we were gathering at the end from whatever sources was biased against Hussein and really wanted him out, and they were just feeding uh, baloney, so to speak. And second question, what is what is the real future politically of Iraq in the, in the region? Thank you. That's a simple one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, your question about... Uh, um, Security? Did he know? Uh, yes, he did. He did know. Uh, uh, he could hear very easily bombs going off and IEDs on the road. Uh, he was fairly. He was housed uh, fairly close to the road, and so it was not hard for him to hear airport road. That is, uh, it's not hard for him to hear explosions. And at times he would say, you know, I, he he said to me. He, uh, and there's a passage in the book, and a lot of people have focused on this because it's really there were times that that. He was very prescient, and one of those said, he said, you know, you're going to fail here. And I remember thinking, but Saddam, you know, you're, you're our prisoner, your country, your government's no more. Uh, how are we going to fail? And, and he said, well, you don't understand the Arab, you, you don't understand our history, you don't understand our culture, you don't understand our language, and you don't understand the Arabic mind, and that's why you're going to fail. And I remember thinking, sitting there, I didn't want to give him the benefit of me agreeing with him, but I remember thinking, you know, I think you've got a point, you know, and uh, um, uh, and he was right. And then he also said at one point, and this was, I, I came back to this years later, and I saw this passage in my notebook, and I remember thinking, my God, he said, you know, Iraq is going to become, now that you have me here, and now that you've, you've come in, Iraq is going to become a playground for terrorists. Uh, and you, you, it's going to be a playing field, I think is, is this phrase, for terrorists. And um, it's going to get worse, and it's going to spread. So, um, let's see, what, what was the other question? Uh, his, his impressions of America. Oh, right, right. Yeah, um, uh, and, and do, it, do Americans have a very poor understanding of Iraq? Um, yes. I would say, largely, in, in, largely speaking, in the intelligence community, the intelligence community has um, has some very smart people on the Middle East, and the State Department also has some very smart people. Uh, I think that when I came in in 1998, I was really impressed with some of the, the skills and the un, really deep understanding of of, of some of the uh, analysts, but as after 9-11, as the numbers started to, you know, be beefed up to deal with the Middle East and with the war on terror, um, I, I saw a dilution of the quality of some of the analysis. Uh, that, and, and to be quite honest with you, I think the intelligence community as a whole has, you know, it was focused on the Soviet Union for so long that and, and even then, we got things wrong with, with them. I mean, you know, the thing about intelligence is it's not perfect. And it's not like you don't know everything. Um, and, and it really helps sometimes when you have a president who, who understands that, as opposed to the last three or four presidents who feel that we have a, a crystal ball in the basement and that we can just consult it every now and then and, uh, and give them the answer they want. So um, we could definitely do a better job 
And I, I think there are, uh, there's a case that can be made that it's because of our focus on the Soviet Union and European culture, which is natural for Americans to sort of want to be focused on, um, the Middle East can sometimes, it's sort of like um, a dog whistle in the sense that it, it, the dog whistle gets blown and Middle Easterners will, will hear that whistle, that sound, but Americans have deaf ears and they, won't, they, won't, they don't even hear it, let alone understand what it, what it means. And uh, I would have thought, my hope had been after 9-11, that that was going to be like our Sputnik moment. That was going to be the moment in which Middle Eastern studies would be catapulted in academia and that our government would pour money into this so that we would build a generation of Middle East experts who could help us. But um, I, I don't think that ever happened and certainly it's not going to happen in a Trump administration. So, And as far as you, the, uh, the intelligence, that, uh, you know, some intelligence was given to us from partners that were, you know, was good. Um, there was a lot, there was a lot of intelligence that was passed that was bogus and that did have an absolute purpose of being mis deliberately misleading. You know, um, two, two words, Ahmed Chalabi. Um, uh, you know, that's, that says it all right there. Uh, one of the misfortunes of 9-11, though, was, you know, this sort of um, perfect storm of this catastrophic event and then this deluge of information that is churned up and now is being sort of put out there because nobody wants to be holding on to the information. Like if there had been a, 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 an intelligence report that had all the names of the hijackers that had been held back, can you imagine you know, the, the uproar that would have been? So now agency, the Pentagon, everybody's pulling, putting out this, this bilge, pumping out their bilge water. Um, and then you also get a lot of new analysts who are working, for example, on Iraq as we beefed up our numbers. And I think it was sort of a perfect storm uh, in, in the failure of analysis. And also, there's something that has happened to the intelligence community, and I talk about, a little bit about this in the book. There's something that's happened in the intelligence community, and that is the, the tendency to prioritize current intelligence over strategic intelligence, constantly feeding the, the appetites of policymakers on a day-to-day -day basis with the latest and the greatest, which is like catnip to them, but it comes at a price, and the price is, your analysts no longer are, are thinking in terms strategically. They're no longer thinking in terms of longer time frames, They're, and they become experts on this day-to-day -day thing. But when you say to them, "Okay, well, what does all this mean? What is, where, where is this going to be in ten years?" You know, they're like they're it's sort of you know uh, deer in the headlights look. So, um, uh, and I, I don't think that uh, I, from all indications, I, I don't think that that has changed, uh, and that's that's a shame because this, this, when I used to go and look at current intelligence, a lot of times if I was working on something, I'd, want, I'd go back and see what we had written over the past six months, and I'd look at all these memos and these things, and I, I would be like, this is, this is worthless. It's not even, it's not even good his, you, historically. Um, and therefore, it's sort, of a, it's sort of like current intelligence to me is sort of like a, a, a Diet Coke that gets poured in and it tastes really good and it's very bubbly and but you don't want to really want to read the Diet Coke or you don't want to drink the Diet Coke a week after it's been sitting out in a glass and anyway let's try to take some in the back maybe uh, Phoebe Marr I'm a historian of Iraq and I've also spent time can I ask you a question Beg your pardon? Can I ask you a question? Uh, no, I've forgotten. <laughs> That's no, when is your, your book is coming at your... Uh, so hopefully soon. Oh, hopefully soon. I'm waiting for it. Okay, good. Um, I wonder if I could get you back a little bit more on 1991 and the, the infamous discussion with uh, April Glassby. Uh, I, I'm just fascinated on S Saddam's motivation and um, what he took away from that meeting. Did he expect the United States uh, you, you know, to, to come in? And I remember hearing from the, the policy community that there was some thought uh, that he was, uh, the situation was so dire afterwards that he might actually you know, leave or be bribed to leave or something like that. That wasn't my opinion. But I'd be very interested in in in, in hearing yours. So I wonder if you that do he would you be deal? bribed to leave in two thousand 
three. Is that what you're? No, no. I'm I'm back in 1991. Okay, okay. And the the going into Kuwait. Yeah. Well, I asked him. I, I, you know, I said, why didn't you? I said, why didn't you just? You know, put Ali Hassan on the throne. You know, or or somebody on the throne and and just leave and pull out your army. You would. Basically, you already achieved what you had wanted, and he, he, he just looked at me and said, why would I do that? You know, it's like, Kuwait is ours. You know? Ask any Iraqi, Kuwait is ours. There's no Iraqi's gonna tell you that this is a separate country. Uh, as far as April Glassby goes, um, and, he, and he, I, I think, and to be honest with you, and I, I, I think there are a lot of Iraqis even today who believe that, and not just Sunni. Uh, I think there are lots of Shia Iraqis that might maybe look at Kuwait the same way. Um, but as far as April Glassby goes, we talked a little bit about her, more about the, uh, you know, his, his thinking about what he wanted to do. Um, but I think that Saddam walked away from that meeting hearing what he wanted to hear. And uh, he didn't, it was, it was unremarkable to him, I think. He, it w didn't seem to be anything that really stood out in his mind. He just said that he had met with the American ambassador. She said that they didn't have, uh, personally, I think if we had been clearer, uh, first of all, I, 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 I've always felt that April Glaspie was, um, uh, uh, did her job and that she was, uh, became kind of the scapegoat of this thing. And, uh, you know, um, one of the things, one of the most interesting aspects of, of that whole time is what the Bush administration, the first Bush administration is dealing with in terms of, you know, you've got, in the first two years they're in office, you've got the, the fall of the European satellite country, or the, the, the deterioration in the situation of the European, East European satellite countries of the Soviet Union as they all break away from Moscow. Um, you've got the Tiananmen Square. Uh, you've got um, reunification of Germany, fall of communism in the Soviet Union. I mean, all of these things, these, these high ticket, high price ticket items of the Cold War, these, these absolute musts of the Cold War are, are happening. And I, I think that the Bush administration, you know, um, just doesn't see or, or is not paying attention to what's going on in, in Iraq. And also, um, truth be told, the, uh, the intelligence agency, the, uh, the analytic assessment of the uh, agency at the time was that Saddam was going to lick his wounds. That Saddam had, you know, fin they finally brought a close to the uh, Iran-Iraq war. Uh, and that Saddam was going to lick his wounds and rebuild his country, and that he didn't, he, he was not going to be a menace to any of his neighbors because he couldn't be. And, uh, uh, and I think that you take a combination of those, put them together, and you have an administration that's not paying attention, sufficient attention to, to somebody who can be very unpredictable, and also somebody who has his own calculation that, as I said, um, you know, a guy who is deeply in debt, money's very important to him. He wants to get out, he wants to be able to rebuild his country. He also wants to make sure that his military is, doesn't start, isn't so bored that they start plotting against him. And uh, you know, it's a pretty volatile mix. Let's take another round of questions. Right here, this gentleman. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Jack Rapansky, unaffiliated. Um, are there any specific lessons you can offer from your experience uh, with Saddam that we should, that you think we should apply to current leaders like Assad in particular and Putin as well? Over here, that's a great yes. question. Uh, Sorry. Thanks. Um, three quick questions. Um, one, I've never understood how it can be said that Saddam Hussein used ma weapons of mass destruction on his own people or the Kurds, I guess. But we didn't find any. So just if he had them, why didn't he have anything at all? I mean, so uh, the, also, is it typical that interrogators are reliant on translators as opposed to knowing the language themselves? And the third thing was it hard to get your book through the CIA, um, whoever CIA oh, has. <laughs> that's, that's another session altogether. Oh, okay. Okay, um, your question about leaders. Uh, 
What lessons? First of all, um, we have to do a better job of understanding world leaders. Uh, I, I think it's great that the agency has, uh, you know, it used to be our, our own separate office, um, but you know, leadership analysis doesn't get the the doesn't get its due, I think, in the agency at times, you know, um, and, but yet in a crisis, or a lot of times, you know, a policymaker will say, well, what's going on in uh, Zimbabwe, or what's going on in uh, Iran, but when a crisis hits, when something, when it starts to get, when the heat gets turned up, it's not so much what, what is Iran up to anymore, it's what does the supreme leader want, then who is the supreme leader, uh, tell me about him, and so therefore, I mean, we, and we have to do, I think that the agency does a good job in leadership analysis. They have some really great, lead, I worked with some truly great leadership analysts, but we can always be better. Um, as far as our government goes, we have this weird, weird tendency in American foreign policy to kind of look at world leaders and when they do something we don't like, we try to ostracize them, and then we uh, eventually, at some point, we, we become kind of obsessed with them, and then our media becomes obsessed with them, and then the final stage, it's almost like cancer. You know, it's like the final stage is, we call them Hitler. We say, this person's just like Hitler. And once you, and it sounds great to our domestic audience, it sounds like we're being tough. You know, Hillary Clinton called Putin Hitler. Um, and that, but we don't realize that when we do that, we, we climb out on a ledge and we, and we, we shut the window. Uh, we can't get back in because once you've called somebody Hitler, it becomes incredibly difficult to, you can't negotiate with Hitler. You, you, can't, you, you can't find common ground with Hitler. You know, you gotta get rid of him. And we close off our options. And I think a lot of times our policymakers and our politicians don't understand that. So, um, what was the... Uh, there was that question. WMD against the Kurds, and yet there wasn't any WMD. Yeah. Well, no, there was no nuclear WMD. I mean, Saddam had caches of, uh, of stockpiles of chemical weapons, you know, that, were, that, are being, that have been located. And um, uh, so, I mean, it's not that he was WMD less, but we knew about, about those things. We knew about some of the things that had been discovered during the UNSCOM process. Um, uh, and in fact, some of the the New York Times did a very, uh, very lengthy uh, expo not expose, but long pieces on the ramifications for, and the health ramifications for many of these soldiers who came upon some of these stockpiles, uh, and and what happened. Um, but, and what was your other question? Oh, they were micro. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, Saddam understood English very well. He spoke English very poorly. But a lot of times when I was talking to him, he, he you know, as far as my Ar Arabic language skills go, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't have gotten very far. Um, and some people say I, I have a distinct problem with English as well. But um, the, uh, it, it would be better, but it's not, it's not a game closer, you know. Uh, it's... Uh, I know the FBI uh, person who succeeded us was an Arabic speaker, um, but he, you know, he also had a number of other FBI people in the room who were helping him who didn't speak Arabic, and so they had to do it through a translator. Um, and in fairness, um, George Pirro, who was the FBI uh, special agent involved, um, yes, he knew Arabic, but he didn't really, uh, you know, he, he was... In fairness, he was put into a very tough situation uh, by being given this, this incredible assignment at the very last minute, and then he had to become an expert on Saddam in a month, which is impossible. You know, and uh, you, 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 you don't go in front of Saddam Hussein with just having read a few reports and a few cables, because one of the first things he always did, you know, play, talking to Saddam Hussein was like cat and mouse all the time. And he would ask a, I would ask a question, and I'd say, well, what about Muqtada al Sadr? He's like, no, I said, what about, tell me about, uh, was, we were talking about Muhammad Sadiq al Sadr, who was his, his father. And so I said, hmm, refresh my memory. I'm not sure I remember him. And so then you would have to tell him. And it was his way of kind of trying to find, figure out what it is you knew so that he could then figure out what it is he, could, he would tell you. And, uh, and it was constantly like that. 
So, um, you know, and, and sometimes it was just, you know, he would try to give some, so, as far as having, what was really important was not only, maybe not so much as the language, but having the subject matter expertise in the room. Because a lot of times he would try to sort of fob off answers that were, that were very statesman. Like talking to Saddam Hussein was like reading a really bad Washington memoir. Because he, we'd always try to, to use these very high, high motivations. You know? And I'd say, look, what, what, was the, what, what do you think was the greatest achievement of your regime? And he would be like, well, the, the, the year we tried to change the Iraqi constitution and make it more pluralistic, I think that was the, that was the high point for me. You know? and, you'd, like, and I would sit there and say, yes, OK, aside from that, you know, what was so? And then you would have to go on. And it was sort of like peeling back an onion. So. And we had one more. What was the? What was this? Oh, oh, gosh. Um, Bruce and I were just talking about this. Um, it, all told, I mean, I originally gave them, them the manuscript in 2011, got it back in a few months. Then I didn't do anything with the manuscript for about two years. And then I, about 2015, I gave it back to them. And then that took a, a, and even that took, all told, it took about 14 or 15 months. And the problem with this is that it is such an untransparent process that your mind kind of runs away with you and you start thinking of all these conspiracy theories of what's going on, why are they not giving this back to me? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting angry about this and, you know, they, they're doing this because they want to screw me or they want to, they don't want the truth to come out. And really what it boils down to and what I've come to figure out is that it's, it's more a, a bureaucracy that's overtaxed and unmanned. And part of that is I, I don't think that the agency has ever really embraced the idea of people leaving the agency and writing books. It's always kind of seen this as some sort of a betrayal. Um, and but you know they're 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 shouting against the wind because one of the things is that they've had so many employees in recent years who have come in and then left and are now working not only on books but on screenplays and um, you know uh, sitcoms and God knows what else you know so take another round over here this gentleman either one of them hi I'm David from Johns Hopkins. Um, can you explain the discrepancies between your impression of Saddam uh, earlier in your career when you were studying him versus after meeting him? Discrepancies. Are you sure. Sure. And how about, uh, I'm sorry, right behind there. Hi, John. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for speaking and writing about Saddam. I think I really appreciate it. Um, uh, my name is Ali Ali um, from GW. Uh, two questions for you. Uh, how many... Uh, did Saddam reach out to Osama bin Laden when he was in Sudan? And the hint to this, to this question, how many times? Uh, second question, uh, how did you make sure he was, he was telling you, he was answering your question in good faith? I re read a piece in the Independent about, about you asking him about his uh, back pain, and, and I believe he, was, he, was, he wasn't telling you the truth for... Uh, proof, uh, proofing you wrong and not giving you the credit uh, as being you, you fully understand his character. So, so thank you. Um, as far as discrepancies in what I learned about him prior to and after, uh, there was a lot of mythology attached to the figure of Saddam Hussein over the years. And some of it had been put on him by commentators and analysts and, uh, and academics based on things that they had heard. Uh, some of it, I think, Saddam promoted uh, himself. Um, I mentioned the body doubles being, being one of them. Um, another thing was this. I remember uh, attending a lecture by a noted scholar, Amatia Baram, who I, you know, I've read his books, and I, I find them I don't always agree with them, but I always find them very interesting and, and well worth reading. Um, but he had told, I remember him telling us this story about how Saddam was a young man. And uh, he, he said, you know, um, he, he was a, a, a basically, a, his father died before he was born. And then he was raised by his stepfather. And uh, 
Saddam would, you know, his mother was a, a bit of a soothsayer and a bit of a kind of a, an oddball, even by Tikriti standards. And, uh, you know, and he would sometimes be pushed around by his, by his uh, schoolmates or his friends and, you know, playmates and what have you. And, you know, it must have been difficult for a, 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 basically an orphan uh, in a, a society where the father figure is so important. Um, in which the, the father is sort of, you know, you're, you, you gain your prestige from him, but also he's your protector as well. And, uh, and Mamatsius told the story about how one day Saddam had a gun and, uh, you know, the kids kind of came to give him a hard time and everything, and he just sort of lifted up his jacket and showed him the gun and they backed off. And that that was the reason, why, that it's from that that stems his, his need for nuclear weapons, you know. Now, um, I, I'm, you know, he, there was more detail to it, but that was the point he was making. Um, now, I kind of talked to Saddam about this, and he just laughed. And he said, everybody had guns. What are you talking about? You know? And he said, you know, it's like, and if you didn't have a gun, you went and found one. So, you know, it's just like, the, it, it, and it was, it was such an interesting way of, 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 of getting this, 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 this breaking through kind of like this, this myth. Um, there was an, another time when I was talking to him, and, you know, he was describing how, you know, he, he was describing how just his childhood. And another thing was that his stepfather beat him. And uh, that he was, um, and that was, this is another reason why Saddam is uh, looking to get weapons of mass destruction, because he's trying to protect himself. You know, because he grew up in this dysfunctional household, and his stepfather beat him and was brutal to him. And I told him this, and he said, I love my stepfather. He was, he was the most wonderful man I knew. He, he's, he's, what, he's the person who made me what I am. He, he saw that there was nothing here, and he was the one who told me to go to, to Baghdad, to move to the big city, and, and to seek my fortune there, because he knew that I, could not, I would never achieve it at home. And, and I had no reason to believe that he wasn't telling me the truth. Uh, you know, there were times when, again, there were times when Saddam could be very, you, you just wouldn't believe him. And then there were times when you could, you just got a sense that he was speaking from the heart. Um, as far as the question about how do I know, well, Osama bin Laden. Um, we had, that's a question that we got asked a lot, both before 9-11 and certainly after 9-11. Uh, at the agency from policymakers, and you know, never we never came to the, any other conclusion other than these were these were incidental contacts that these these organizations you know as as terrible as Al Qaeda is and Osama bin Laden they had contacts with a lot of people and that a lot of times this is the way business happens in the region, but we never found any sort of sub substantive ties between Saddam's regime and Al-Qaeda. Um, and as far as, and certainly when I was talking to him uh, in captivity, uh, we talked about this, and Saddam basically felt that Al-Qaeda and his regime, you know, were, had conflicting goals, and that he had never, he never, these were the people that threatened him. Saddam said that he didn't fear, he never said, I'm afraid of things, and he never said, I fear anything. And I, and I think that that was true. He didn't fear things, but he had concerns. And he was, his one, the, one of his most profound concerns was the threat of Sunni extremism to his regime. He said that was more of a threat than the United States or Iran, because Sunni extremism could kind of, it was one thing if the Shia misbehaved. It was another thing if the Kurds misbehaved. They could be identified through his intelligence apparatus and his security apparatus fairly easily. But if the Sunni community misbehaved, then that's something that could rot his regime from within. And he was always very, very uh, careful about that. And even to the end, when I said, I mentioned how disengaged he had become, that was one area where he had always, he always maintained uh, a very strong interest and, and remained engaged in. Whenever it came to his security, um, you know, this is, this is the thing that allowed him to live for as long as he did. So um, that's something that was very important to him. I'm going to bring it to a halt here. I know that many of you have more questions. Um, 
The book is going to be for sale in the back of the room, and John has agreed to sign copies, uh, so you have a chance to uh, get in one more question if you buy the book. Yeah. Uh, I do want to uh, underscore, and I think this hour and a half does beautifully, this is a really fascinating uh, episode. Uh, we rarely have the opportunity that you have, and I want to thank you um, not only for coming here today, but for writing this book, because there aren't going to be many times in history when the United States captures one of its enemies and actually gets to talk to them. We need to know what happened. We need to know what goes on in those debriefings. So thank you very much for doing that, and thank you for coming to Brooklyn. Thank you for having me. Thank you.